Okay, well first of all, the central aim of this uh, presentation is to contemplate the mysteries of the Passion and essentially in order to try and save our souls. So we're, we've got a wee bit of theology just to begin with, we call it Catholicism 101. If everything was straightforward and everyone went to heaven, there would really be no need to try anything, there would be no need to attend Mass, there would be no need to amend one's life. But we know this is at stake and our blessed Lord warned us of this. And that's why we have to contemplate the mysteries of the Passion to try and grow closer to God, especially during the time of Lent. The Shroud of Turin um, is the most studied relic in the history of the Catholic Church. There are many, many thousands of relics that we've become familiar with through history, but the Shroud, as we know, is the most studied relic. And we have a picture here of uh, Pope John Paul II uh, venerating the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin is so... Um, the, the, the exploration of the Shroud is so involved that it actually has its own discipline and that discipline is called Syndenology. It's a whole branch of science where people can devote their lives to the, st the study of the Shroud. In today's presentation, I'm not going to be exhaustive with the research. I really just want to try and present you with a kind of working knowledge of the Shroud of Turin so that you can leave today and at least have certainly more information than what you had to begin with. You've all seen the shroud in the church. Uh, the shroud is a high quality linen, linen sheet of herringbone weave. It's 436 centimetres long and 110 centimetres wide. And the copy that we see in the church today is an actual, that is a replica copy. That is the exact size that you would see if you were to venture to Turin to see the shroud in the flesh, as it were. Why is it controversial? Well, it shows a man's frontal and a man's dorsal image as though the man has been crucified. And we know that all four evangelists speak about how our Lord was placed in the tomb and wrapped in a linen sheet. And this uh, depiction that we see here is a kind of good description of how the shroud would be wrapped around an individual who had been crucified and placed in a tomb. So why is the shroud so controversial? Why would I be giving this presentation today if you know, anyone in the modern age could replicate the shroud? Because then it wouldn't be controversial. And the National Agency for New Technologies, if we read this quote here, quote, this inability to repeat and therefore falsify the image on the shroud makes it impossible to formulate a reliable hypothesis on how the impression was made. So in other words, it's controversial because we can't replicate it. If we could replicate it, if anyone could replicate it, I wouldn't be giving this presentation today, nor would the shroud carry the, 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 uh, the weight that it has. The image on the shroud is not the result of direct contact with the victim, another reason why it's controversial. If we could replicate the shroud by placing a cloth over a dead cadaver, then this would, it would not be controversial. The image of the shroud that you see, when you see that faint image of the man on the shroud, the image does not penetrate uh, the cloth, but the bloodstains penetrate the cloth. If we look at the wound on the wrist here, we can see a faint blood stain. The projector doesn't really do justice to the, the sort of potent red, crimson red colour that we have. Um, there is no sign of any paint on the shroud. There's no sign of any brush strokes. Again, had there been signs of paint or brush strokes, there would be no controversy because clearly someone would have forced this. And finally, the image on the shroud is very, very superficial. It only makes up one tenth the diameter of a human hair. A good analogy to draw, if you can try and picture this in your minds, ladies and gentlemen, if you were to sit on the pews in the church, think about the thickness of the mahogany that you're sitting on the wood and think about how fine that coat of varnish is on the wood. And that kind of gives you an idea of how faint the image of the shroud is and how superficial it is on the top surface fibres of the cloth. And the shroud also has a unique pixel light phenomena uh, where we see darks and lights similar to the picture we're going to look at in just a second. Okay, everyone, so let's look at this picture here. We can see a black and white photograph. But from a distance, you can see lots of greys as well. But we all know from photography, when we look close up, we actually have black and white dots that make up the picture. But from a distance, you can kind of see greys. Now, the shroud has the same phenomena. When we look at the surface of the shroud, for example, here's a close up here. These dark browns that we look at, the dark browns are what you see in the image of the shroud. When you stand back and you see the crucified man, that image that you're looking at is this part, this brown section here, 
versus the, the lighter colour. Now, the dehydrated carbohydrate surface of the shroud is what causes that discoloration. So we have a linen cloth and there's, a been, there's been some sort of dehydration process that's caused the cloth to discolour. But it seems to have done it in such a way that it's actually formed the image of a man. And we'll discuss that, we'll explore that further later. First of all, before we delve in, we have to look at the shroud as a mirror image. Now, why do we do that? If we look at the shroud here, we can see that the man has, the man has sustained a wound to what appears to be his left side. Now, if I was to try and illustrate that to you. So let's suppose in here that I've sustained an image to my, from my perspective, my left side. I then show you that. But as you can see now, the left's actually became right and the right has became left. So everything in light of the shroud has to be viewed as a mirror image. Now there are sightings of the shroud prior to the 13th century. Without going into the small print here, there's been several sightings in the years 544, 752, 944, 1144, and finally in the year 1204. And these were in the regions of Edessa, which became modern Turkey, and Constantinople, which became the centre of the empire back in the day. And you can actually see from this artist's depiction here, this is what was known as the Adisa image. Now, the Adisa image that you're looking at, in Adisa, this shroud would be brought out of a box. It was carried in a box, but it would be pulled out in such a way, ladies and gentlemen, that one could only look at the face, but there was a whole cloth there. But on feast days, it would be brought out simply to show the face alone. And the question I would put forth is, is this Adisa image actually the shroud that we know to be the Shroud of Turin? That's where we're trying to join the dots. Now, historian Ian Wilson, a great Shroud scholar, comments that Pope Stephen III, this is in the year 752, Pope Stephen III said, quote, Christ spread out his entire body in a linen cloth that was as white as snow. On this cloth, marvellous as it is to see, the glorious image of our Lord's face and the length of his entire and most noble body has been divinely transferred. So here we have a Pope back in this era commenting about a cloth that he has seen that is a cloth that wrapped Christ and is nobly and has a divinely transferred image. We then look at, uh, we look to Budapest, the National Library, where we find prey manuscripts from the year 1190 AD. And again, we can see artist depictions of the crucifixion. When we look at these close up, ladies and gentlemen, we can see from this lower picture, we have the cloth of the shroud. You notice the shape in it, it's a herringbone weave. It's got those crisscross patterns, which is synony synonymous with a herringbone weave. But further to that, here we have the Shroud of Turin. I just want to draw your attention to some very thought-provoking point. So we have a close-up of the artist's depiction of the Shroud. Um, and we can see, can you see those four holes that are kind of L-shaped? Yeah. Well, when we look at the Shroud of Turin, we find these same four holes. So one would ask themselves, is it possible for an artist in that time to have depicted a painting of the shroud with these holes, which are incidentally damage caused by fire. And again, this is several centuries before the shroud was allegedly forged, according to the secular viewpoint. It just seems to, it seems to fit too well. So in the year 1204, the shroud disappeared. It disappeared for the best part of 150 years. We had the Crusades. Yes, a lot of bad things happened, a lot of good things happened, but relics back then, everybody wanted one and the shroud mysteriously disappeared at that time. But it did emerge 150 years later, in the year 1356. Um, can you all read that small print? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> My normal line would be, I'll go and have some coffee and let you decipher the, <laughs> the information. But essentially what we're saying is, from the year 1356, both the believer and the sceptic alike concede that we have an, a chronological historical account of the shroud from that time onwards in the year 1356. So in that year, the Shroud begins its journey in Europe, in France, and it belo belonged to a family called the Descharny. And the, at that point, it was known as the Shroud of Lyrie because it was kept in Lyrie in France. And you can see that the king at that time, uh, King Geoffrey de Charny, he had this ingot made. And if you look at this ingot, we can see the Shroud, the frontal and the dorsal image. We can also see the box that would hold the Shroud. And we can see this kind of cross that would be used to attach the shroud when the shroud was pulled out on feast days to display the face alone. We can also see uh, the Roman flagrum here, which would have been used to scourge Christ. And then we have quote, uh, some coats of arms and various other 
various other uh, parts. And th these ingots were actually, these were kind of mass manufactured. So on this particular feast day, someone had these cast and then they would be handed out to the pilgrims visiting the Shroud. In the year 1453, the Shroud became the property of Louis, Duke of Savoy. And you notice as well, this the, the Shroud was within um, the possession of nobility back in the day because they recognised how important it was and how it was necessary to protect it, especially um, uh, during that time. So the Shroud be became known as the... Um, the Shroud of Chambery, because that's where it was kept. And then in the year uh, 1532, kept in this church that we're looking at on the right-hand side, the Shroud was then exposed to its first major fire. And that was during the evening of December 3rd to 4th. The fire broke out, causing the silver box, which was kept behind the high altar here. Uh, the box became red hot. The globules of molten silver, if you kind of imagine that, they fell through the actual cloth itself. Completely incinerated sections of the cloth and that's why we see the damage we see today in the cloth. So if you can imagine for the moment, ladies and gentlemen, I know the projector doesn't do justice to the sort of detail in the image, but the top the image would... The cause of fire was fire in the church? Or? There was a fire in the church, yeah, there was a fire at the high altar. Was it deliberate? Who knows? It was such a long time ago. Um, the shroud would have looked something like that. The shroud that we see today looks like that. And then this middle... Uh, this middle photograph that I put up, that, that's essentially the damage that we can see. You can see these asymmetrical triangulations. If you imagine the cloud, uh, the, the shroud folded into four sections and then these globules of silver falling through, that's why we have these asymmetrical patterns. And these were actually repaired, these patterns were repaired. There was a cloth sewn onto the back of the shroud that came, became known as the Holland cloth. It was a poor Claire's back in the day that did that. It was a very, very refined piece of gold cloth that was attached to the back. But during the restoration of the shroud in the year 2000, that cloth was removed to try to ascertain exactly what damage the shroud had inflicted. So if you were to go and see the shroud today, this is what you would see. September 14, 1578, amidst probably great pomp and circumstances, shroud arrived in Turin to then reside at St John's Chapel in Turin. It went to Jirin because the Savoy family had moved their, uh, I think their, pro their providence had moved to, their, the capital of their headquarters had moved to Jirin. They took the shroud with them and then the, the shroud went to Jirin and it's essentially been there ever since. And that's why we call it the Shroud of Jirin because that's where it's kept. But that Shroud of Jirin was once the Shroud of Lady and the Shroud of Savoy and what have you. So it's a different names during its time. If you were to go and see the shroud today, you possibly could see this if it was on a particular feast day in St John's Church. Now this high altar, ladies and gentlemen, this, the, the artist who has, the, uh, the, the photographer who's taken this picture has used some artistic license and actually added the high altar. That was also destroyed in a fire. The shroud's not been spared its fair share of fires. So that high altar's no longer there. So the, art, the, the photographer superimposed that painting of the old altar on top of the picture. So the question that we have to ask thus is, do the injuries found on the man of the shroud, let's try and be impartial for the moment and say, right, we don't know whether or not the shroud is the shroud of Jesus Christ. Do the injuries found on the shroud corroborate with the passion of Jesus Christ? That's the thing, the first thing we have to ask, because if it doesn't corroborate, then we can't say with any kind of certainty that the shroud of Turin is the burial cloth of Jesus Christ. So we want to just do a wee quick step-by-step, -step, baby steps through the passion of Christ to see if we can find these wounds on the man of the shroud. So the first up one we look at is a scourging at the pillar. So we read from the Gospel accounts that Pilate had Jesus scourged and the scourging would probably have taken place using one of these um, implements, the Roman flagrum. And if, we've all, if anyone has seen the Mel Gibson film, The Passion of the Christ, he depicts this in um, incredible detail very, very gruesome, very, very bloody. So we look at the man of the shroud, and yes, we actually do. We find that his back, um, the size of his ribs, the back of his legs, uh, and his buttocks have been have been uh, lacerated with a, low, a Roman flagrum. The question we would ask: We can see these small sort of. You can see the flagrum wounds. It's a small bow bearings wrapped together, hitting systematically. How many scourges do we see and what limit was set? Well, when we look at the man of the shroud, pathologists can answer the question, how many scourges do we see? Now, during the time of Christ's crucifixion, the Jews had, there was a limit on the number of scourges, scourges because you could essentially kill a person just by scourging them. The Jews had a limit of 39 lashes. 
Now, what would happen during that time is two men would systematically work the body up and down. And within min uh, literally minutes, they could take a very strong, you know, carpenter, someone very, very muscular, and could re reduce them to, be in, to, to behaving like a slave, simply purely by fatigue and blood loss. Um, the, the scourges, that, when we look at the Shroud of Turin, the, the, Romans, the Romans had no such law. When we count the number of scourges found on the man of the Shroud of Turin, he has had no less than 120 lashes. So we have this Jewish limit of 39, and here we have 120 lashes. Now the thing about it is, based on the pathologist reports of today in the modern world, that man would probably have been close to death simply by the scourging. But we do know when it came to the case of Christ, Pilate wanted to scourge him profusely to try and send out a message so that he could dismiss him and not have to crucify him. And that's probably why the scourging was as brutal as it was. Article number two, the crowning with thorns. We read in the gospel accounts and the soldiers twist a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Yes, we find the man of his shroud has indeed been crowned with a crown of thorns. And when we look at the frontal, the facial image, and then we look at the nape of the neck, Again, a, forensics would, a forensic scientist would look at this and say we can see profound blood flow at the nape of the neck. This is apparently a very, very sensitive part of the body. But when we look at the man of the shroud, it's not so much a crown of thorns, it's more a helmet that's been pushed into the head, which must have caused the most agonising of pains. And interestingly as well, we can also see this sort of back to front, um, sort of uh, three. And the question, again, posed forth would be, what caused that? Why do we have a specific shape? Was it actually because the man of the shroud, perhaps the helmet of thorns was falling off and perhaps they used a piece of rope to tie it? It maybe resembled something like this. But here we're now trying to bring in some historical points now. We have a Byzantine coin here from the year 692 AD. And we can see in the Byzantine coin, ladies and gentlemen, if you look at the hairline here, we can see at the top we have this kind of unusual shape. So this particular coin that's been minted in the year 692 AD, the question would be, why would a a person who forges a coin have Christ with a particular shape here? Why would they specifically put a particular shape into the hairline unless he had actually seen that unusual shape of the blood flow with the man of the shroud? So it's just a question I'm putting out, putting out there. I was very, very fortunate at a shroud conference uh, last summer. I met this particular man. Um, the term, the <laughs> um, Justin Robinson, he is a numismatist. I think that's the proper terminology, a person who is an expert in medieval coins. I'd never even heard of such a thing. So I was very fortunate to actually hold these coins, the coins that I'm presenting today. Um, and Justin Robinson's a great scholar, and he's got several uh, articles online trying to draw the parallel between the Shroud of Turin and medieval coins. The carrying of the cross, article number three, has the victim of the shroud carried a cross? Yes, well, when we look at the shoulder blades, we can see there has been aggravation. You can see these sort of wounds where the wounds are more inflamed. So a pathologist can tell us he's carried something on his, on his shoulders. And of course, we read in John's Gospel that he bearing his cross went forth to a place called the Place of the Skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. So the carry of the cross, would Christ have carried the complete cross? Probably not, because he had already lost so much blood and he was close to death. So it's most likely he was asked to carry the patibulum which would have been part of the cross. The crucifixion, article number four, this is a depiction of the crucifixion. What I find quite interesting about this is that at the foot of the cross, we can see this skull. So medieval artists would draw a skull at the base of the cross, but because tr church tradition teaches us that Christ was crucified on the spot of Adam's death, Adam the first man, Christ the new man. I thought that was quite nice. Notice with the crucifixion, we have the absence of thumbs and extended right arm. One arm, arm being longer than the, than the other. There's nothing in the Gospels about, you know, Jesus had one arm longer than the other. But if we read the revelations of uh, Anna, Anna Katerina Emmerich, if anybody's read the life of Jesus Christ, and Anna Katerina Emmerich says that when Christ was crucified, um, to, to outstretch his arms on the cross, the, the holes for the nails weren't long enough. And Mel Gibson depicts that in the film. And they tear literally get his arm you know and pull so they had to dislocate the arm to actually get his body to get his arms to fit in the cross so that would explain on the man of the shroud why one arm's possibly longer than the other it's obviously a theological point we don't have to hang our hats on it and verify it to be true but it's and very interesting uh, nonetheless when we look at the actual arms 
and the crucifixion. We can we see we can see four fingers, one in each hand, but we don't see specifically any thumbs. And I'm going to talk about that. Um, and if I neglect to mention this, remind me later on just to highlight that point about possibly why there is an absence of um, thumbs. Uh, the victim, the victim of the shroud, has been nailed through the feet. We can actually see the feet in this this part, in the lower part of the shroud. We can see the blood flows. Uh, a pathologist can take this and look to see what sort of detail we can ascertain from that. We can see one foot. The other foot seems to be disguised. There's been a fold in the cloth. We can see an asymmetrical pattern here. Again, going back to those coins, we seem to see in a Byzantine coin from the year 869, we have a depiction of Christ. And we don't have two feet facing forward. We have one foot facing forward and one facing to the right. Again, it's just quite an odd depiction to put on a coin. Why would you not have the kind of order that you would expect with just two feet? Has the person who's forged the coin, did he see the shroud and notice one foot was absent, one foot was placed to the side? But when they, came to, when they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead and they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came forth. Article number five, the lancing of the side. Isn't it interesting that John recalls seeing water and blood? He doesn't just say there's blood, he says there's what He saw what he specifically thought was water emerging from the side of Christ. The fountain from the right side of the temple as quoted in Ezekiel in the Old Testament. And we can see with the man of the shroud, he has indeed been lanced, not on his left side, but on his right side, because everything's a mirror image. And a pathologist can tell us, purely looking at the man of the shroud anatomically, that that wound has been sustained between the fifth and the sixth rib, which would most likely have pierced the heart. Now, if you imagine the man of the shroud being crucified, and then the loss of blood from the head to this region where we have the ribs, and then death occurs, and then the person remains on the cross for a substantial amount of time, and is then taken down from the cross and the body's capsized to its side, we could then imagine we would have blood flow coming from the, kind of the, the leg torso region. And perhaps that's what we see when we look at the man of the shroud. Now, this was an item I felt it was, I felt it was imperative that I, I, I uh, added this particular slide. You're thinking I'm, we're going to go into a biology lesson here. Um, the heart has a, a chamber that protects it. It's a cushion for, you know, getting, for bumping about. It's called the pericardium. Now, pathologists can tell us that when you, we have a victim of torture who's been extremely tortured, the pericardium in the heart inflates and it fills with more what's called pericardial fluid. So this is found in modern day victims of torture, specifically in the heart. So the question thus would be, when John talks about the water being seen, was it the case that the centurion lanced the side of Christ and what he actually saw was pericardial fluid being released from the heart mixed with blood? Going back to the earlier slide when I'd mentioned about the body capsizing, when we look at the man of the shroud, we can see there's blood flow just across the lower back here, ladies and gentlemen. Again, it's just a question being put out there. Could this have been the result of blood flow from the back when the body was taken down from the cross? And just one final point, actually, because some people kind of still hold to this. Well, you know, I, I'm listening to what you're saying, but this must have been formed with a cloth covering a person. If that was the case, if you imagine, if I was to place a cloth you know, like this, and then open the cloth up for you to see. So let's just try that. Just imagine that I'm covered in bodily fluids and blood, and I was to then try and translate this gruesome disfigurement that I have to you. If I did that and then opened up the cloth, you would get an elliptical form. Think about that. We don't see that with the shroud. With the shroud, we have... I guess we could call it collimation, where we have the image perfectly three-dimensional, moving forward, but not elliptical. So this image that we look at, this is not the result of contact with a victim. This is not how the image has been formed, and that's why we have this controversy. We would see something like this, had the image been formed by direct contact with the victim. So let's do a quick summary, ladies and gentlemen based on the historical account of the Gospels. The man of the shroud has been crowned with a crown of thorns. 
The man of the shroud has been lanced. Not on the left side, but on the right side. The man of the shroud has been taken down from the cross. He hasn't been left to decompose on the cross. And the body has been given back to the family. The body is unwashed. Now, why was the body unwashed? Because time was of the essence. This was Good Friday. It was Passover Friday. The Jewish custom was that everybody had, everyone had to be at home for 6 p.m. That was the rule. You couldn't have somebody dying on a cross. So Christ had to be killed quickly. And that being the case, it was probably the case that he was nailed with one nail through both feet so that he would struggle to get those vital breaths that he needed. It wasn't uncommon, apparently, for victims of crucifixion to be on the cross for days. They would put small chairs under them and they would just sit there and crows would come down and perch out the sky. And that's how brutal it was. But Christ, the killing had to be quick so that Christ would be in the tomb. Hence, there was no time to wash the body. The women returned on the sun, Sunday, Easter Sunday, to wash and anoint the body. The shroud was removed. There's no putrefaction of the shroud. The shroud must have been taken away from the body. And of course, finally, the Turin shroud is made from a fine herringbone linen cloth. So we've got six points there. There's been no science in that, just simply six historical points taken from the gospel. So if I was to then say to you, right, okay, assuming this is an authentic burial cloth of a victim of crucifixion, what is the probability that this victim is Jesus Christ? Do some basic sums, okay? So if I was given to saying, right, probability of a first century victim of crucifixion being crowned with a crown of thorns. There's no one else depicted in history being crowned with a crown of thorns except Jesus Christ. If I was to say to you, right, maybe someone else was crowned with thorns, but let's just say for this time being, we've got a one in 200 probability that someone was crowned with a crown of thorns. What's the probability of this victim of crucifixion being lanced in the right side of the heart? Because the tradition was to break the legs, not to lance. If I say it's one in two, I could, I could be generous and say that could really be, I've been very generous, I could be more cynical and say it would be one in a hundred chance. What's the probability of a crucifixion victim being lanced to ensure death rather than the breaking of the legs? I could say very rare, maybe a one in 50 chance. What would be the probability of a crucifixion, a crucifixion victim being given back to the family? Because the tradition would be, or the custom would be, you know, the person was most likely a criminal and we get thrown into a pauper's grave and never be seen again. And yet here we have the body being given back to the family, hence it was able to be wrapped in a shroud. And what's the probability of a victim of crucifixion being wrapped in an expensive fine linen cloth? What's the probability of a criminal back in the first century being given a very expensive fine linen cloth and placed in their own tomb? I could say it's a one in 500 chance. Now, I'm being very generous with my probabilities. Now, let's do the sums then and see what this, how this works out. Okay, so we've got 1 in 200 times 1 over 2 times 1 over 50. You know, I'm being facetious now, times 1 over 500. So we've kind of got a point zero 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 five probability that it's Jesus Christ. Now we do, we invert that in statistics to give us an answer. What is the probability the shroud is the shroud of Jesus Christ? It's a 200 million chance to one that it is him. 200 million chance to one. It's most likely by a factor of 200 million to be the burial cloth of Jesus Christ, simply based on those wounds. And of course, that list that I've given you is not exhaustive. You could, you could go further with that and have an, have an even higher probability. And one professor in Italy has done that. Um, and you can see the statistic that he's produced here. He's got a one in 200,000 million. What's that, one in 200 billion chance that it is Jesus Christ, just based on what we've just done. So even if you did that with caution, you still have a probability this is the cloth of Jesus Christ. So the shroud, of course, for centuries would have helped Christians to meditate on the passion, death and resurrection of our blessed Lord. And it would have enriched the church's teaching regarding his suffering because the early church would have something tangible to look at and not simply be dependent upon um, hearsay and the passing on of word of mouth. So we've now moved on, we've now moved on several uh, millennia. We're now in the year 1898 and we have the scientific revolution. So everything I've presented so far is up until that time of the scientific revolution. Everything that we've looked at with the shroud so far, that kind of part one, is just simply by looking at the cloth, but not having any scientific analysis of the cloth. We now go to the year 1898, we're in Italy, we're in Turin, and the church has given permission for the first uh, photographs to be taken, this new invention that we call photography. And we have this lawyer 
amateur turned amateur photographer, so, so Conde Pia, been given the opportunity to photograph the shroud. Now, if you think about it, ladies and gentlemen, when we think about photographs, and we have to kind of go back to the old days, most of you would maybe remember, the children won't remember, the days of where a phot photograph was developed and it was taken into a, a dark room, and there was, you know, silver iodide chemicals, they would lace, the, the, they would lace the, the, the plate, the photographic plate, and everything would invert. So all the light tones would become dark, and all the darks became light. That's essentially how photography works. Because of digital cameras, we don't need that now. But that's essentially the photographic process. So here we have Seconda Pia with a camera that's probably this size, and he exposes it to the shroud and then waits, and then Julie retires to his lab to see what he sees when he develops the photographic negative of the man of the shroud. And this is what he saw. And the, f the famous uh, French poet Paul Claudel uh, summed it up thus. All the wonder of being in front of the image of the face of the man of the shroud, a face that can never leave anyone indifferent because in that image a search seems to be summarised. That is as old as man is for his deep hunger for happiness. To quote Paul Claudel, Claudel himself, the deepest search for God who has torn the veil of history and has come into the world with a well-known face and body. I thought that was a lovely sentiment from the poet who, that was on his first experience being exposed to the photographic negative of the shroud. But of course, we've simply looked at the face, ladies and gentlemen. Think about the entirety of our Lord's body and how much the shroud gives up the detail of the agonies of the crucifixion, the agonies of the scourging. Because you would most likely agree that going from this where the sufferings are hidden to this where the sufferings ex are exposed and of course, this then allows pathologists to examine the man of the shroud in much, much more detail. Again, going back to those coins, you'll be thinking, I have got a thing with these, these medieval coins. Here we have some coins from the year 969 and 1028. And again, we have the depiction of Christ on the coins. You'll notice on the one on the left, you can see you actually have a swollen eye, as though the person, Christ on the coin, has been punched. Of course, when we look at the man of the shroud, we can see we do have a swollen eye. Someone has, someone has punched him. And with the depiction uh, of Christ on the coin uh, on my left, we can see that we have here a displaced nose septum at this point here. Of course, a pathologist can tell us the man of the shroud has a displaced septum in his nose. So again, question, would it be possible for a medieval forger of a coin to mint that coin, is it possible for him to have that detail unless he had actually seen the man of the shroud? Could a medieval forger craft such a fraud by creating a photographic negative that actually appears as a photo positive when viewed as a negative? So that is a question we're trying to answer. Look at those two pictures. We have the picture on the left. We have a regular photograph, but when we take a photographic negative, everything is inverted. So if you were to appeal to your common sense, is it possible for someone in the Middle Ages to do such a thing? But to do it without any sort of technique, without any painting, without any you know, artistic binder and so on and so forth? Is there any other information to corroborate the story? Drum roll, step in. Something, another religious artefact known as the Sedarium of Oviedo. So you might think I'm going off at some sort of tangent. What is the Sedarium of Oviedo? Well, in Spain, in Oviedo, in Spain, there is a napkin cloth that is 83 centimetres wide by 50 centimetres wide. The napkin cloth has been there since the 5th century. Here it's here. I think you would all agree there's nothing terribly impressive about it. We don't see the face of Christ. But this is believed to be the napkin cloth that covered the face of Jesus Christ in the tomb. Because again, ladies and gentlemen, when we go back to the Gospels, the Gospels don't just talk about the shroud, they talk about the napkin cloth that covered his face. Because there had been so much blood loss when Christ was crucified, a napkin cloth was also fastened to the face to try and collect those bodily fluids. And this has been in Spain since the 5th century. So it goes way, way back before the medieval times. Now you're thinking, what's relevant about this? Well, here's a relevant point. First of all, here's a great prolific Oviedo cloth expert, this is Mark Guskin, he's written many books on this. 
but it's been noticed when we take the man of the shroud and we look at particular secretions around the nose area, which is what we see on the left, and then we take the sedarium of Oviedo on the right, we notice we have a correlation with the blood stains. And I've actually just done a sort of a squiggly line. If you look at this, see, this is just one particular correlation we see. If you look at that, and we look at that, so we have those two points, and there's there's congruent blood stains. In other words, those blood stains are in the same position. Now you might then ask the question, well, that might just be a coincidence. It might be a coincidence, but it can't be a coincidence when there's over 130 congruent blood stains. Now what does that mean from a pathologist's perspective? It basically means the sedarium, this napkin cloth that's been in Oviedo since the 5th century, covered the same person as the shroud of Chirin covered. It covered the same victim. Now this has been confirmed by a great pathologist, Dr Huanga. This is a picture with him and his wife. He's long deceased now, God rest him. But he was a American, he was a forensic scientist and he worked in the States and he established there was over 130 congruent bloodstains. And he aptly illustrates the point that in an American court of law, to convict someone of a crime, you only need 40 congruent bloodstains. And here we have an abundance of bloodstains correlating the Oviedo cloth with the man of the shroud. So in other words, just based simply on that fact, the shroud could not have originated in the medieval age. It was long, long before that, because we go back to the fifth century. And if we look here, we have the claim that the shroud is a medieval forgery, but we can't say that any longer because we're now going back to the fifth century. So we're now going to look at the second part, which is a briefer part. We're now looking at the shroud in modern science. I'm trying to give a breakdown. We're looking at the historical aspect, but let's look at science. That's what we're about. We want to see what science tells us about the shroud. So in 1978, the Catholic Church gave permission for uh, researchers from NASA to investigate the shroud. There was 40 or so members, uh, many of them from NASA, and they were given permission on the 400th anniversary of St. Charles Borromeo, to make, uh, who made a pilgrimage to the Shroud. The story is his city was sp spared the Great Plague and he went on pilgrimage to the Shroud barefoot, you know, for some, I think it's 500 miles, <laughs> barefoot. That was in the days of pe proper penance, wasn't it? Um, so the church gave permission for NASA to look at the Shroud. Now, what actually provoked interest, ladies and gentlemen, we have a picture here, this is uh, Pete Schumacher from NASA. A new technology was invented called VP8 technology. Now, do you know when you're, you, know, you fly along in a plane, you take pictures of the ground and hills and mountains and what have you? Well, topographists, they will, they will take that information to try and ascertain the height of mountains and what have you. And this was a technology that was in its infancy. But when Pete Schumacher did, applied this technology, this analyzer to the man of the shroud of the photographic negative, he noticed that he was seeing from that there, he was seeing 3D characteristics. And this really, really, this shook him to the core because he had tried this technology with other black and white pictures and it never ever worked. And you can see one of the examples of this. Here's a picture of an elderly person and then here is the VPA applied to it. And you'll notice everything's wrong. First of all, the nose should be the most prominent part and yet the nose, as you can see, has been kind of deflated. But it only seemed to work with the shroud and that was one of the reasons that NASA then contacted the church and says, look, we have to investigate this. So the church, give it its due, duly agreed to that and they were given 126 hours. So all the technology went to Turin. It was all shipped over from the States and scientists worked round the clock for 126 hours. And what this all, this is, here's some pictures. Every, every single scientific method was applied from, you know, ultraviolet fluoroscopy, mass spectrometry, all these different methods to try and ascertain why, how the image was formed on the Man of the Shroud. And what this also did was allowed external experts like Fred Zagaby, pathologist, it allowed them to analyse the data to see if they could contribute anything further to the scientific endeavours. I had to go back to that hand, didn't I, with the wound. You'll notice there that the Man of the Shroud, again, based on high resolution photography, we can ascertain that the Man of the Shroud has actually been nailed in the wrist. Now, Fred Zagaby was saying he did um, experimentation with victims of crime where they had sustained a wound through the wrist. Now Fred Zagaby was saying that with this particular wound, this wound violates what's called the carpal bones in the wrist. Now the carpal bones contain a nerve known as the median nerve. Now when you take the carpal bones 
and you fasten something to that, if you, if you puncture the carpal bone, you sever the median nerve, but the median nerve controls the thumb. And what he found with victims of accidents and crime, um, when the median nerve was severed, it had the result of causing the, nut, the thumb to contract. So the question again would be, is that why we do not see any thumbs on the man of the shroud? Because we have this, this contraction taking place. So, in very brief, I'm not going to read all of the print because again, this is not exhaustive. This could go on and on. I'm just going to highlight some, some of the more um, salient details of the findings of each discipline of the research of the shroud. First of all, it is not the work of an artist. We have to get that clear. Some people still hold to this, oh, somebody really clever, you know, Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo. It was not the work of an artist. Every artistic expert who has looked at the shroud says, this was not painted. With regards to blood, the blood chemistry is real. There's human blood from actual wounds. This has been confirmed by 13 different tests. There's bile, bilirubin, serum album, haemoglobin and other blood components, and the blood can even be identified as being AB. The blood is crimson red. Again, pathologists can tell us when we have a victim of torture. They produce very, very high amounts of a chemical called bilirubin that's found in the constituent of blood. And that causes the blood to dry in crimson red, unlike this sort of brown blood you would see with a regular, uh, a regular injury. And the rare AB type has also been found to be chemically, chemically identical to that found on the sedarium of Oviedo. And incidentally, I'd actually just found out recently the AB type being a rare blood type but it's very predominant in Middle Eastern men from that region. And of course, the scourge marks and other areas are loaded with this substance called bilirubin, but the bilirubin can only be detected using ultraviolet fluoroscopy. So again, a question that would be put forward, could a medieval forger have anticipated that in 700 years, we would have a technology called ultraviolet fluoroscopy that would find bilirubin on the forgery that you've created? It seems highly unlikely, doesn't it? Pollen, yet the shroud is, has an abundance of pollen grains. There's over 150 pollen grains, many of them from the Middle East, from the area of Jerusalem. But we also find pollen grains that might give a historical um, direction of the shroud through Europe during the Middle Ages, because we also find pollens from other regions. And then finally, textiles. Um, the cloth is of Middle East origin. So if we have a forger in the Middle Ages, the forger must have acquired a first century linen cloth to perpetrate the forgery. And finally, image signs, which we've already touched upon, ladies and gentlemen, the image is a negative, but only beca becomes a positive, only when it's viewed as a negative. And the image is a result of a dehydrated carbohydrate layer on the surface. Up until this point, nobody knows how that was, that was formed, but we'll touch upon that at the end of the presentation. So here we are, we've now moved on to the year 1988. Shroud uh, interest is at fever pitch. Scientists all over the world are becoming very intrigued and asking that question, is the Shroud of Turin the actual burial cloth of Jesus Christ and how was it formed? So based on this, the church gave permission to the scientific body to do what was called the carbon-14 test. Now, what more um, grand an institution would, other than the British Museum to carry out that task? The British Museum being very famous you know, for its archaeological research, its scientific research. So the British Museum, we can see the picture here, um, was given that task. Now this is where the story kind of takes a turn because you're probably thinking, well, he's going to sort of say there was something, you know, sinister, something ominous taking place during that test. And we're going to talk about this for the next few minutes because this is very, very important. Uh, and I'm sure you'll be suitably shocked by what you're about to hear. Now this is an old depiction, um, an old artist painting of the shroud on display back in the medieval age. And you can see here there was no bulletproof cases or gold frames. Or the shroud was just carried out. When the shroud was shown on feast days, it was literally carried by the corners. No one would ever have thought, you know, in a five or six hundred thousand years time, these rarities have to be protected and preserved. This was just when there was really no appreciation for anything of... Uh, historical or cultural value. And of course, just finally, um, you can see um, the corner from where the shroud was cut to do the carbon test was actually, that's what it was, it was a corner. A corner that had been held for centuries. And that was precisely the point where the British Museum decided to cut. But there was a lot of skullduggery with this because certain members of the forum were excluded 
when they said that the agreement was that several samples would be taken to try and give a more um, unbiased result. And we'll just look at this over the next few slides. It went to press that the Shroud of Turin sadly was a medieval forgery. It is a medieval forgery. And this, these three men, uh, Dr. Ed Holt, Michael Tite and Robert Hedges, these were three um, acclaimed members of the British Museum who went to press, and we can see the date, why they put an exclamation mark on that and why they just look so unhappy and arrogant, we'll never know. Um, so essentially the shroud was just sold to the world as being a medieval forgery, but of course people within the scientific community say that's, that's not enough, explain to us how you arrived at this result. So what they essentially did was they took the cloth, before I mention the material, in fact I'll go back to that, if we can just look at the graph at the top ladies and gentlemen, there was three samples sent to three different laboratories, this is where it gets interesting, you had Arizona, Oxford and Zurich, and you can see those windows of timelines, so we've got the 1264 to 1275 for Oxford, and then we can see with Arizona and Zurich, it's lit almost like a century later, that's the dates. They took those three results, if you can think about the arithmetic, and simply just took an average, and that's why we get those dates of 1260 to 1390. Now, before we explore that uh, on the next slide, when I was doing some research on this, I was able to find a Telegraph article from 1989. And listen to what it says, quote, on Good Friday, March 25th, 1989, 45 businessmen and rich friends presented to Ed Hall of Oxford £1 million for his services and having determined that the shroud was a medieval fake. Hall said he was using the funds to create a new chair of archaeological science to be filled by Dr. Michael Tite. So certainly a bit of nepotism going on there and also the money's involved, a bit of money exchange. And the, the world was sold this, and if this, this shroud fever, this fever that we spoke about, it just, it just disappeared overnight. And it was like, wow, it's terrible. The shroud is a medieval forgery. And yet prior to this carbon test, many, many scientists were kind of coming over to religious thought to believe that this actually was the burial cloth of Jesus Christ. And this was one of the articles found in one of the newspapers. Um, again, we have um, this kind of, you know, the arms folded, almost a kind of an arrogance, quite happy that the shroud is now shown to be a fake. But nobody was prepared to, or at least to be allowed to discuss the detail of what actually happened during the test. But just bearing in mind, before we, before we finish this part, we've got the radiocarbon date, which tells us the Shroud is a medieval forgery, but everything I've presented up until here, we can look at these, this information. All these sightings prior to that, the Sedarium of Oviedo, the, the, the medieval coins, um, all this information, the sightings of the Shroud, Pope Stephen III, all of this was just discarded because the carbon test was seen as the, you know, the creme de la creme of the scientific process in modern age. And it was one versus the other, but it wasn't one versus the other, it was just a case of, well, it doesn't really matter if the shroud was seen in the 9th century because the carbon test has shown it's a forgery. And that was it. Now, this is where it does become, I guess, you know, um, there, there certainly is a sinister aspect to it because we had this agreement, this consensus, that this is what would happen during the test. There would be multiple sample areas. Now, yes, you might say, well, if there was multiple sample areas, you might... You can't cut from the middle of the cloth. You could destroy the, the face or the torso. Or, but you certainly wouldn't take everybody taking one corner and then splitting that into several samples and dividing that. So there was no simultaneous comprehensive examination. The carbon test was meant to be conducted by seven laboratories. At the last minute, the British Museum says we're only using three laboratories. There was meant to be blind testing. There was no blind testing. There was no conferring between the laboratories. And then, of course, that scientific body we spoke about earlier, STURP, the Shroud of Turin Research Project in 1978, the NASA scientists were excluded from the carbon test, completely excluded. That, wasn't, that, that, was, that, was, that decision was made at the last minute. So what does all this mean? Very, very quickly, I'm just going to give you a wee lesson on stats. I'm, probably sitting with a very eminent statistician who's going to say, you're not quite accurate with that, but let's go with this. We've got a thing called a significant level calculation. And this, everyone should understand this. So let's say I was to hand out to you a measuring tape. So we do a small lesson, everybody gets a measuring tape. And I say, okay, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, could you measure the length of the room, please? And then I'll write down the results, okay? So I get, I don't know, uh, 25 meters, okay? 
Chris gets 26 metres, someone else gets 24 metres, someone else gets 23, someone gets 100 metres, oops, someone comes back with 1.5 kilometres, someone comes back with 15 centimetres. So based on the data you bring back, you get a significance level calculation. Now, if everybody pretty much in here says it's we're give or take 25 metres plus or minus several metres, you would know that's probably quite accurate. But if someone's coming out with something like, you know, 1.5 kilometres, clearly a problem with the data. So uh, statisticians look at that and they perform what's called a significance level calculation. And when I take the data, when you hand in your measuring tapes and I write down the results, if the significance level falls below 5%, then it's useless. You can't use it. It's not accurate data. But if you're up here where we've got the green, if you're up at the 78%, maybe 90%, maybe even 95%, you know you're kind of right. You know, I get 25 metres, Chris gets 26, somebody's 24, you think, right, we're looking at that area. So statisticians do that. But of course, when this was applied to the carbon dating of the shroud, look at the, da look at the data that come back, look at the reading. The significance level was 0.24% based on the data that had come back. It was useless. It, wasn't, it didn't even get close to the 5%. This is a major problem for statisticians. But, but not only that, this, even that figure, even that figure was modified. Through a Freedom of Information Act from a professor of Oxford University, right, Thomas, uh, Thomas Casabianca, a professor um, of history, he requested the actual data that was used in the carbon test. And this is going to astound you. Here we have the Arizona results, here we have the Zurich, and here we have the Oxford. Now, back in 1988, the data that was reported to the media was the data here in white writing, those numbers that you see here. And then, eh, sorry, I beg your pardon, the data that was reported was the data that we see in yellow. So that, this data here, this data here, and this data here. But the Freedom of Information Act ascertained that that was not the original data. The data had been changed. So this was the original data. Now this original data gave that figure that I had mentioned to you of 0.24%, which was meaning the data was absolutely useless. But by modifying the data, as you can see here, this gave the result of 4.18%. So it was kind of close to 5, and they kind of ran with that. And that's essentially what happened. Now, when the British Museum was asked to explain why they changed the results, to date we still don't have an answer regarding that. But what we do know is the results were changed to try and make the significance level look good, to try and get it close to at least five. But let's be honest, if this carbon test had been done properly and accurately, it should really be up here somewhere in terms of the significance level. But again, going back to that part of the cloth that they're holding, this is a part that's been you know, touched for centuries, but not just that. There's all that saying is that God takes the lowly, doesn't he? And he exalts them, and takes those who think they're exalted and, <laughs> you know, humbles them. Here we have Sue Benford and Dr. Professor Ray Rogers, Nobel Prize chemists were involved in the Shroud of Turin project from the 1970s. Sue Benford, um, nurse by profession, no academic background in physics, chemistry, you know, physiology. Sue Benford saw the shroud on television and automatically, you know, with that kind of childlike enthusiasm, went, my goodness, there's the face of Jesus. And then she fell in love with the shroud only to find out the shroud, it was claimed, was a medieval forgery. So Sue Benford wrote her own paper, did her research and wrote her own paper claiming that the shroud, that corner that we're referring to where they cut, was actually a medieval repair. I mean, this is a fascinating story. So Sue Benford, nurse by profession, no, nothing in academia with regards to forensics or anything to do with medieval cloths. And I've got a copy of the 12-page report here, and she claims that it was a reweave. And she said that because the ultraviolet fluoroscopy shining on it was slightly discoloured at that corner. So the story goes that Barry Swartz, who was a photographer on the project in the 1970s, Barry Swartz reads her paper, kind of thinks quite compelling. Okay, let's send it to Ray Rogers. Ray Rogers was directly involved in the project. Hi, Ray. It's, uh, it's Barry here. You know, we have this lady, um, you know, from the lunatic fringe, as they called them. She's claiming that the part of the cloth was a medieval repair. And Ray's like, ah, yuck. you know, so this is a Nobel Prize winning chemist. He says, just give me five minutes, Barry. Off. He'd kept his own small sample in his laboratory. He says, just give me five minutes and we'll disprove the lunatic fringe. And the story goes, the, the phone call five minutes later, Ray, 
Barry, yes. She was right. She was right. Yeah, he found everything in that corner that would indicate that we have a medieval repair that was carried out at some point. So under close examination, it became evident that there was a medieval repair. So when the carbon test had been conducted, not only had they taken some of the original cloth, they'd actually taken cloth from the Middle Ages and carbon tated both half and half. And then when we then reapply, you know, the data, we could then see that, that that's highly, highly possible the reason why the data was actually skewed and the result came out to be the way it did. So we have a master forger at work. Let's find out his attributes. Right, so this person in the 14th century is an expert in autonomy, anatomy. They've got access to fresh blood from a victim of excessive torture and they're knowledgeable in understanding fresh versus post-mortem blood. A pathologist can tell us when we look at the shroud, there's fresh blood, pre-mortem, and there's also post-mortem blood. They've been able to acquire a first century expensive linen cloth for the purpose of recreating the forgery. They've got a mastery of photography and the principles of light inversion and photographic development techniques and so on. They can code and code detailed anatomical information that they can't even see with their own naked eye. They've travelled to the east to get those wee pollen samples just to sprinkle on it and you know in 700 years time they'll, they'll fall for it, all those gullible people in the 20th century. And they've also managed to find some rare calcite salt that's found on the man of the shroud, it's found on his nose and on his knees. And it's a rare calcite salt, ladies and gentlemen, that's only found at the gate of Jerusalem. So this forger knew this and specifically travelled there and brought some of that calcite salt and thought, well, I'll just put some on the nose, put some on the, on the knees and they'll fall for it. They're also an expert in haematology back in the 14th century and they're aware, they're aware of bilirubin bile and ultraviolet fluoroscopy long before these things were invented. They've been able to apply 400 anatomically correct bloodstains because the bloodstains were laid down before the image. Another factor which makes the Shroud of Turin unique. And when the image forms on the Shroud, by whatever process it was, they anatomically match up. And I always ask myself that question. You wonder when the forge, forgery was being perpetrated, you know, did they kind of think, you know, well, should we put down the blood first or put down the image? One wonders, don't they? The forgers have advanced post 21st century technology. They have an atomic laser. They can etch a literal micron from the sur surface of the cloth over the millions of fibrils. And of course, since the blood stains on the head match the sedari with Oviedo cloth, the forgers have travelled from the 13th century back to the 6th century to superimpose both cloths at the same time to then uh, to commit the folly. What did Holmes famously say, my dear Watson? After all, once you've eliminated everything that is impossible, whatever is left, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. So finally, ladies and gentlemen, just to wrap up, could the shroud be the result of the resurrection? Now, why would that be precluded from the debate? It would be precluded because we live in a secular world where the scientific body refuses to believe in the existence of the supernatural. And yet, science in the day was something where you, you followed the evidence. That's called the scientific principle. You don't just go off at a tangent simply because it may involve something that you have a philosophical bias against. Well, meet Professor Paolo De Lazaro from um, the National Agency for New Technologies in Italy, and he has just, he's done just that. He's tried to ascertain if it's possible to replicate the Shroud of Turin to create that discoloration that we're referring to. Now, here's what he's done, okay? He's taken, that's a thumb, it's very faint, and here we have a one centimetre square piece of cloth made from linen, similar to the shroud. One small centimetre. What he did was, in a series of experiments, he exposed the cloth to an eczema laser. And then he recorded how much energy he had exposed um, that was instant upon this small piece of cloth. But it had to be done in very short bursts. One fortieth of a nanosecond. Very, very small burst because if the laser was left switched on for more than that, it incinerated the cloth. When it was left on for less than a 40th, it didn't discolour it. It had to be absolutely precise to create the effect. 
And that's what he did. Now, when he did this, he looked at the energy value to then generate the power requirement to discolour that small piece of cloth, which is the size of my fingernail. And he found that this requirement would be something in the order of 16 megawatts for one small piece of the cloth. But of course, we're not dealing with one small piece of the cloth that's been discoloured. It's the entire cloth that's been discoloured to produce the image of a crucified man. That's the sums. When we apply it to the whole cloth, we're looking at 0.27 trillion watts of power to actually be generated to produce the image that we see in the cloth. The question, can anybody explain how that could be possible? That a certain value of radiation, 0.27 trillion watts, incident on a cloth would produce the image of a crucified man. Now, the latest research from Dr. Paolo De Lazaro is looking at linen cloths from the first century. There's a new technique in science developed called WAX, wide angle X-ray scattering. So he's essentially applying a branch of physics that can look at the scattering of X-rays incident upon a cloth to determine their age using a cloth of known age. So he takes a cloth from the first century, he can take a cloth from the second century, third century, fourth century, and he can then ascertain from those based on the X-ray scattering what age the cloth is, but the, the age is originally known. So when he does a calculation for the first century, he gets first century. When he does a calculation for a third century cloth, he gets third century. He's applied this to the shroud, and the answer he gets is that the shroud is a first century image. So Kenneth Stevenson, the project spokesman for the shroud in 1978, put it aptly. He says, what better a way, if you were a deity, of regenerating faith in a sceptical age than to leave evidence 2,000 years ago that could only be defined by the technology in that sceptical age? Isn't it those, those gods got a sense of humour? You know, here we have them with all these instruments and all these gadgets and phones and things going through the air, and here we have this image, and to date nobody can explain how the image could be formed. But what we do know is, if we could explain it, it would require 0.27 trillion watts of power. And finally, just to finish off, the final slide, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a website here, uh, whocanhebe.com. There's a very, very recent production being made by the Shroud of Turin Research Project uh, in England. Um, and this is a fantastic documentary. You can stream it online or you can buy the DVD. It's been produced by this wonderful man called David Rolf. He's a great syndonologist and has spent the pa best part of 50 years researching the Shroud. Today I've given you a kind of glimpse into the world of syndonology, and by all means it is a glimpse because this is a topic that is so vast and people can spend decades studying it and still never get all the answers. So this documentary, Who Can You Be?, essentially looks at the modern technology and looks at the Carbon 14 fiasco. I'd given you a small insight into the dishonesty that was taking place with the British Museum, and this documentary explores that further. And there's a kind of, um, at the end of the documentary, there's a wonderful revelation that I don't want to share with you because I want you to just go online and uh, look at the documentary. So, to sum up, you've been a wonderful audience. Um, the kids have been extraordinarily well behaved. It's been a big day for everyone. Um, I'm quite happy to take several questions just before we finish off. Um, I'd like to thank Father Peel, uh, the Friars, and it's lovely, lovely to have the sisters here as well. It's quite incredible. Um, and um, I'd just like to say thank you and God bless.